Hello, welcome to Profiling Evil Podcasts by Mike King. It's a privilege today to have a friend on, an old friend, Christine Barber from Street Safe, uh, New Mexico. Christine, I, I uh, want to thank you for taking time out. I, I know that today's been an incredibly busy day. You've actually been uh, working a human trafficking case, and, and you just got off of the streets of, of uh, Albuquerque and are taking time out. But uh, how are you doing otherwise? Uh, good. We're always busy at our nonprofit trying to help everybody we can. So, Yeah, it's amazing. Take a minute and just tell everyone a little bit about uh, Street Safe and the overall project and what the purpose was because you've been doing this for at least six or seven years that I'm aware of. More than that, actually. So we, um, Street Safe, uh, was the direct result of the West Mesa serial killings um, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So between, uh, for those who don't know, between like 2003, 2005, uh, women went missing from the street. And so uh, it was about 11 women missing. There's more than that, but um, the 11 women is what we're going to concentrate on for this this part of the story. Um, But no one outside of the street population um, and the police actually knew anyone was missing. Um, And until the bones of the women were found in 2009, February in 2009, um, and all of the women were found in kind of the same site. And so now it's the West Mesa murders. I was working at a nonprofit at the time that helped women on the street and mostly homeless women and stuff. And we just got to talking with other volunteers and we said, how could that many women, 11 women go missing from one population and the rest of normal society not know about it? Like that just was astounding to us. Well, one of the other volunteers spoke up and she said, actually, I used to be on the street um, and she used to do dates like a lot of the women on the West Mesa did. And so what dates means is that you were selling sex. And so she used to do dates um, and she got kidnapped by a serial killer while she was doing dates. Um, And that um, serial killer was David Parker Ray, who um, some people know is the toy box serial killer. Um, He kidnapped her to Elephant Butte and he held her for three or four days until she was able to escape. And what Cindy said during that conversation was that if she hadn't escaped, she knew he was going to kill her and that her family, even though they're all here in Albuquerque where she went missing from, her family wouldn't have reported her missing for at least two weeks, if not longer, which is what had happened for the West Mesa cases. Because of the lifestyle, you just aren't really sure where anybody is at any moment because they have to move so much from day to day. And so she said something that has stuck with me ever since. And she said, we just need there to be a group that pays attention. So she and I started a group that pays attention, (laughs) um, specifically to women on the streets of Albuquerque. Um, And so it is... Uh, Our main focus is on safety, and our main focus is on keeping women safe from serial rapists um, and serial killers, and we do many things around that. Um, But the the way that you go about trying to catch those offenders um, is to make really uh, decent uh, connections with the people on the street. Um, So you know them, you know their neighbors, you know all the women out there who are doing dates, and you know the women who are being trafficked, you know, the women who are homeless, you know, the women, and they're all sometimes the same person um, and all the addiction surrounding it and all that. And then help them as best you can if they decide they want help. And so that's what we do. Um, we specialize in street outreach. Um, our, our, we get our, we get, we are boots on the ground. So we, we do not mess around as far as that goes. You, you got a trafficker with a trafficking victim in front of you. We will go up to both of them and we will do outreach to the woman without the trafficker ever knowing that we were doing getting her information. Uh, We've been doing this for a while. Well, you know, that's really interesting to me because it, it creates quite a, an interesting level of risk for you personally, as you go into those areas, how, how have you found, for instance, that the Johns uh, or or the person buying sex from a sex trade worker uh, respond when you just show up and start this interaction? And then how does the pimp respond when you're when you're there doing that interaction so when the when the girls are out there actually selling sex we uh don't really meet the guys that they sell to we're not we're not they're adults so we're not necessarily looking to have the intervention between those two we're looking to have the intervention between the woman and the person who's forcing her to do this um the john um not our favorite person but he at least for the most part if he's not attacking her he'll 
he's giving her money, which is a which is a way out. Not great, again, not great, but it's something. The trafficker, on the other hand, is just using her, beating her, keeping her, holding her. So um, the level of danger to us is actually <laughs> incredibly minimal um, because on the street, there is very much a, um, a them, us thing. Um, they know they're of the street. They know we're not. They see us and they know that and they see exactly what we want them to see, which is um, we actually even play a role. Um, we call, and hopefully this won't offend anybody. We call ourselves the joke that we say we're with Jesus ladies. So we are not we are not faith based. However, it serves our purposes for traffickers to believe that we are a faith based group and that if they act out of line at all, they know because we are not of the street, they know we will call the police immediately. So because of that, we have a tendency to play up the, you know, uh, have a blessed day, things like that kind of thing, because it, it gives us a level of protection. And so we actually never have problems. The traffickers, the entire time we're doing the interaction, are trying so hard to impress us that they have no clue what we're doing. Because one of us will be uh, talking complete nonsense to them, and that's usually me because I'm really good at talking nonsense and just like really like ridiculous small talk. And then the other volunteer is the one actually working with the trafficker. And I'm also 5'9", and I'm a big girl. I can block the view physically of the trafficker and be like, hey, how are you? I see you got a Lakers hat on. Love the Lakers. You know, that kind of thing. Just really good at stupid small talk. Um, never has there ever been any danger to us. Um, and we do this constantly. So um, it, is, it's, it is quite interesting. We actually make a joke of it recently, which is not... I hope most people will understand this in the intention that it's meant, but we try to use, I'm definitely, I'm a white girl. So we try to use my, try to, I try to use my Karen-ness for good. I'm trying to be a Karen for good. So um, I, I just try to use that as a, they see me as a Karen, as a potential Karen to them. So I'm going to use that to distract them. You know, it's yeah. really interesting because I, we go back about six years when we were doing work for A&E and, and the film, The Killing Season. And, uh, of course, we uh, spent a lot of time looking at those homicides and those bodies that were recovered in the West Mesa area. It came up with some very strong opinions about the uh, suspect who was responsible for those uh, murders and for burying those uh, women. But uh, one thing that we uh, didn't talk about a lot, I don't know how early this was into the game, but, but law enforcement was still a little bit standoffish. Six years later, how's your relationship with law enforcement? Have they recognized the value that you bring to the table in identifying human trafficking and other kinds of things, and frankly, getting support, even if it's a toothbrush, to these people out on the street? Actually, that definitely has changed. That part of it has changed. That seeing that we do, we are trying very hard to get these trafficking victims help and get them to, 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 Get their traffickers off the street. We are trying very hard for those, especially those underage kids that are trafficked, get them off the street. Um, anyone else who is just in a serious situation trying to help them, a rape victims, things like that. However, around the West Mesa case, that has not changed at all. Um, very much a will no information in or out, nothing, just complete silence on that topic. Um, so where we have a lot more, you know, we. I trust the sex crimes detectives now to help the women on the street. They no longer, um, this, the, the team they have now no longer looks at them and immediately goes, well, you were doing a date. What did you expect would happen? What did you think would happen? You mean you got raped? That was what was going to happen. Instead of saying that, which was with the automatic response before, they come at it with, with, with decency and respect and say, we will help you. I have no idea what's going on with the cold case as, and it's there again, they will get mad at me for calling it a cold case of the West Mesa because they do not consider it a cold case. They will say it's ongoing investigation, even though it's been 12 years since they found the, um, found the bodies and more than that since the women went missing. So, so. yeah, it's amazing <laughs> folks. We're, we're talking with Christine Barber of street safe, New Mexico. Christine and I met uh, many years ago uh, doing a, documentary and investigating the West Mesa murders that occurred there. Uh, 11 women were identified in uh, the area that we searched, Christine. Uh, I know that the, the newspapers and others talk about another nine that they think may have mm -hmm. been attributed to this particular predator. And of course, we isolated those out. 
uh, just based on the fact that we haven't found the burial site yet to, to be able to identify them. But have the numbers grown at all in the last couple of years? No, um, as far as uh, uh, being associated with the West Mesa killer himself, no. The numbers are still the same, and I am still completely 100% convinced that there is a second burial site um, where those remaining women um, are. Um, there is no reason to not believe that. Um, and, and many reasons to believe that the killer ha re had reason to change his site um, when he did. Um, so right in 2005, so between 2003 and 2005, um, that was the set we found on the West Mesa, the set of women we found there. Then the other set of women, the next set, then it's the still unaccounted for um, six to nine, depending. Those went missing from 2005 to 2006, the still unaccounted for ones. In the time in between, the site where he was burying them was bulldozed. So he was in the middle of the desert at the beginning part of it from the 2003 to the 2005, middle of the desert. March 2005, the whole site got bulldozed to become a housing uh area development and then from of course he's going to change sites then so 2005 to 2006. so our belief my belief and street safe's belief is that those that group of women still exist out there they're buried somewhere um out in the desert yeah well we actually in fact i i remember uh, we brought in aerial imagery from the mid 1990s through to 2004 to kind of cover that period. The, the closest home at that time was two miles to the north, and that that sprawl has just—it's amazing when you look at it to yeah. where the memorial is today. We also, uh, and folks, if you go back and look at the story map, you'll see we also talked about how some of the victims' bodies and bones were displaced probably by predators moving those but the majority were were tucked away very neatly in that arroyo but the thing that was so interesting is as we walked from uh, Montoya's uh, trailer to the retention pond to the south and then followed the trail it was pretty easy to start theorizing why he selected those areas so that he would have a view and be able to just kind of uh, relive the experience by looking up on the hillside, similar to, you know, even when you see a, a, a big game hunter that puts the animal's antlers on the wall, it's a way for him to mentally have these trophies uh, that he continued to look at. But um, <clears throat> one thing that just was so intriguing to me as we looked at the victimology of, of these women who died and the fact that they were sex trade workers was the absolute volume of illegal sexual activity that's going on uh, in Albuquerque. Could you kind of speak to that, like the, the thousands of, of uh, paid sex uh, cases each week even? So um, Albuquerque actually is not abnormal in that. This is just like every city. Um, so you're going to have different um, areas where um, uh, people, usually adult women, will be selling sex. Um, and so um, on the streets here in Albuquerque, it is Central Avenue, which is the old Route 66, where women will be selling um, any given time of day. And just an even a two mile stretch, you'll have about 30 women who are out selling sex. Um, and it's just, um, you do end up correctly, as you said, Mike, with thousands of women. Um, it also, any, wherever you, the listeners live, um, you also have to think about the number of people out there who are addicted. Um, because 50% uh, of all women who are addicted to any substance, so alcohol, pills, anything, 50% of those women will do sex in exchange for something at some point. So then you have to add that number of addicted women, half it, and then think this is the pool of potential women who could occasionally sell sex. It's just not something we talk about very often because it's people find it uh, unpleasant or just find it a little off-putting, but it is a reality that homeless women, if they're homeless, they have to sell sex to survive. You're, if it's negative four degrees outside and I am gonna freeze to death if I stay out here, I'm going to go do a date and get the money I need to go stay inside. And then I have just committed prostitution and I've just broken the law just because I want to stay inside and live. Um, but that happens a thousand times a day here in Albuquerque and even more in cities. Albuquerque is, um, I think, 900,000 people um, right now. And so 
every other city our same size or smaller has the same thing going on. Yeah, is there is there a uh, percentage that you would be comfortable kind of guesstimating of of the uh, full time sex trade worker who maybe is that uh, drug addicted, completely down on their luck, being human trafficked human being, versus someone who maybe is even holding together a regular life, but then slipping down and uh, prostituting on the side to to have that extra money for narcotics. So we do know that it's about, um, we try to do more uh, to kind of harder numbers. So it's about um, a thousand women a day who are in Albuquerque, who are uh, who use their sex as their way to, to support themselves and make money because they are they, that's their survival way of making money. And then we have another, um, I believe it's uh, 3,000 that will do it occasionally a couple of times a month. And so that's your pool of, of usual people who are out there. And that's the pool of women we serve because if you're doing if you're doing dates because you got to pay your rent, um, even though you normally work at McDonald's, that's just what you're going to do because you've got two kids at home. So it is a it is something people again don't like to think about having that women have to do, but they have to do it occasionally. So or all the time. And we don't our group doesn't make a judgment on that. It is just it's it's a survival mechanism, and it's what what people have to, what people and including men have to do sometimes. So. Yeah, a- absolutely. And, and we, we need to still take care of each other and take care of mm-hmm. people and what you do. I just, uh, I really compliment. Are you getting any support from faith-based communities in and around Albuquerque? We, we do. Um, and so we do have to be careful. We do a lot of vetting with our faith-based groups just because we, um, there unfortunately can be groups who have said in the past that they don't want to work with prostitutes because their members of their church would have a problem with that. Um, and also groups that we can't have them calling our girls' names, and we've had that problem before too. Um, like we don't need someone to say, oh, go give this to your hookers. Um, that's not really a helpful thing to hear from a church. But having said that, we have many, many churches and faith based groups that we work with who are amazing, and we could not do our work without them. Um, and to, we always like to say together we make up a big patchwork that ends up being able to cover everybody. And so our specific piece of that patchwork are women on the street who uh, who do dates and who um, are addicted or homeless. That's our patch. And so people know that about us and that if you have a question about a woman on the street who might be trafficked, that's us. You know, it's interesting because a friend of mine uh, named Dion works uh, in Skid Row in Los Angeles, and uh, he's a police officer there. He's been on Skid Row as a police officer for 23 years, and uh, and he talked about how they've actually had to try to control the faith-based groups and other groups that want to do the right thing, but but they're not helping the population because they're coming in. He said, he said, actually the people on the street are getting fat from all of the food that they're being given. And, and, uh, but he said, that's not getting them in where they can get a shower and get hygiene kits and get, uh, medical care and get uh, job training skills. Are you seeing the same kind of thing happen down there? So we're trying very hard to keep our faith-based groups and all groups who work with the homeless um, uh, kind of accountable to each other. So we talk a lot about not replicating services. Um, it, it, and again, I agree with your, your friend who works at Beat, and I give him a lot of credit for doing that job because it is a, it is a hard life to stand witness to. Um, he has watched thousands of people he know die in, in front of him basically through the years and for that's Average life of a woman on the street doing dates is 34. So um, this is not, it's a, it's a quick, hard life. Um, but the faith-based groups have the best of intentions and they're amazing and they're lovely. It's just that you're right, sometimes they come on at very odd things and they put themselves in situations that are not safe and they do not understand what they're walking into. And um, for the most part though, I think that we have some very smart groups here in town who have hooked themselves up to other faith-based groups like other nonprofits who do it a little bit more who who do it more frequently and so um and have a lot more experience as far as like yeah you might not want to approach that camp because that guy has some schizophrenia issues and has a machete so um but it, it is the vast majority of people out here are so grateful for the help and 
those churches that step in when it's cold or with some coffee occasionally, they're, they're lovely and I feel like they're really helping. But he's right, he, there's a lot of well-intentioned people who, could, who can cause harm even if they're trying to help. You know, one of the questions that, that I've had, quite frankly, and that I've had others ask me about in regard to the sex trade industry is uh, in an area like Center Street, uh, and I, there's an east and a west a mm -hmm. avenue or something, isn't there, if I remember downtown yes. very well. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there... Um, like uh, segregation of types of sex trade workers, whether it's, uh, you know, um, uh, males who are, are uh, involved in the trade or females or transgender. How, how does that play out or is it just all open game and it's a long list of people? So again, for people who are, who are out there listening to this, this is going to be different for your, for your town and your city. So for instance, International Street in Oakland. It is very much a, you have a trafficker on a street corner, they own that street corner, that's their property and their victim stands there. That is not Albuquerque. Um, Albuquerque is, everyone kind of just moves all over the place. You walk around, you don't stand still. That's how we always know from there from out of town is that you don't have territory, nobody has territory. You walk all over the place um, and um, you, it is, it is definitely not a, there's a certain part of town that, um, you would find men in even. Um, the, there's not that many men on the street who sell sex. That industry moved mostly online um, about 10 years ago. And so it's, it's more, it's fairly uncommon here actually. But we do, we do know guys who do that and we help them as equally as men. We help any, I mean, as women, we, we, we are equal. We help e equally if they're, doing, uh, if they're doing work like that. But for the women here, um, it is, there's no territory. Everyone's pretty friendly. You don't ever try to carve out your own spot. The women walk about 10 miles a day, but they're also really, really smart. And so here, unlike again, International Street in um, Oakland, here they don't wear the stereotypical short skirts and, and crop tops and high heels. If you see somebody wearing that, you know automatically from they're from out of town. And if they're from out of town, they're probably trafficked. Here, what they wear is they're smart. They wear tennis shoes, jeans, t-shirt, and you just walk up and down the street. They might, you know, have makeup on and have their hair done and look a little nice, but that's what they're wearing. They're not, these are smart girls and um, they're not gonna walk that far um, in, in heels all day long. So, which I don't know how much experience you have in heels, Mike. I, um, I, Gosh, I, I haven't worn heels for an awfully long time. <laughs> it's a very, it hurts, especially if you do it all day long on concrete. So, you know, I, if uh, I remember right, uh, when we talked uh, years ago, uh, you, you were trying to give me an idea of, of how many individual partners um, a sex trade worker may have in a given day uh, equated out to being being huge numbers in a month or, or a yeah. year. Um, and so um, here the average is about four a day. Um, and so, um, four times 34 a month would be, uh, 120. Um, and so then take that out for the entire year. Um, and that's just one person. And we do have, um, anywhere from one. And again, this is a very much a scale. So some women only do one date a year. Some do, we know a woman who does 27 a day because that's what she needs to do to, to afford, um, her life and, you know, whatever else you need to do. So. Um, it is, it is very much a, and it's the more partners you have, the more dangerous it is, of course. It is an exceptionally dangerous thing. Um, going back to the serial killer idea, um, I, those of us who are not involved in that, uh, that lifestyle on the street, we have a point zero 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 one percent chance of being killed by a serial killer. Women on the street have a 7% chance of being killed by a serial killer. So you can see just women who sell sex. So you can see that difference alone is what increases them, their level. For the rest of us, it's very unlikely. And if I remember right, at one time you told me there were like 7,000 transactions a week occurring mm -hmm. just in the downtown area. Well, because if you think about it, if you're gonna have 30 women who are doing one date, or doing four dates a day, 30 women's within two miles, doing four dates a day, at 100, so it's like you do the math that way, yeah, it's about 7,000 a week, minimum. Yeah, that's actually probably pretty correct. And so just you have to think along those lines. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, folks, I'm, I'm talking with Christine Barber of Street Safe, New Mexico. Christine and I met uh, several years ago working on a documentary on a serial killer. Uh, Christine, I, I think it would be really interesting to kind of describe the generic uh, street work uh, street workers. Um, t- tell me who they are. Um, they're so going to just do with stereotypes right now, which again is never a great thing, but we're statistically, this is what a, an average life would be. So um, they were born into a house that either had drug use or um, had a lot of drug use around it. Um, there was a lot of, um, a fair amount of violence. Um, and uh, most of the girls were sexually assaulted or uh, uh, molested when they were growing up. Um, they either had somebody they knew who was already selling sex or they had people or they knew of it growing up. Um, and uh, they were in an environment that was broken, just it, it, that in a very gen, gen, general sense, all of them come from a, a home environment that was fairly broken. Um, so it is not uncommon for the girls to have, by the time they're 12 or 13, have felt the street was safer for them than home. That is the case with our our, um, our co-founder Cindy Jaramillo, who again was kidnapped by the West Mesa. I mean, by the toy box killer. She was on the street when the time she was twelve, and taken out of school when she was eleven. And so there is no. That is a very that part of her story is very common. Um, we have many many children uh, who were as children, 10, 11, 12, sold to pay for their parents' uh, debts. Um, and that's how they ended up on the street. Um, and that brokenness just led them to a place where um, they were very vulnerable and very easy to take advantage of. Um, and once you're on the street itself, even if your intention is, you know, I vast majority of girls, if they do end up in the street, they aren't addicted to anything. So um, 64% when they get to the street, when they become homeless, are not addicted to anything. They sell that first date, they sell that first that they get into a car to sell to sell sex for the first time. They're not addicted to anything. 64%. Within two years, 85% are. And they will tell you it's because they have to use in order to do the dates. Because it is so difficult to get into the car, a car, and even four times a day, you get into a stranger's car to have sex with that person four times a day. That's scary. I don't know about anybody else. And it's, it's never gets less scary. It's scary every time, especially knowing there's a very possible re- thing that this person's going to beat you up and rape you and possibly kill you. And so the addiction levels rise and rise and rise as you go in from there. And just because it's all over the place, everybody out, everybody on the street uses. Um, and so um, the lifestyle eventually becomes when you're an adult, you're in a motel one night, if you can afford it, you can't afford it the next night you're in an abandoned house, then you're on the street on a tent, then you're back at the hotel, just depending on what you can afford. Um, you're doing dates four times a day, you're using when you have to, if you're addicted to heroin, you have to use it for four to six hours, every four to six hours, you get very sick. Um, like you have the worst flu you've ever had in your entire life sick. Um, but at the same time, you have to make enough money to feed yourself and you have to make enough money to, to you know, do what else you ever have to buy pads and tampons at the store. Um, and you have to do this every single day, um, or you end up outside and dead uh, very easily. And so it is very difficult to have any kind of planning process when your entire existence is survival in that moment, because the next guy you meet could kill you. The next guy could be the, the most of the women are raped two to three times a year. Um, we had a, this is very common. We had a girl last week who got into a car, was gone for five days, they kidnapped her, dropped her back off in the war zone, um, which is a part of Albuquerque, and um, just in her underwear. She will not talk about it. She had to use right away because she could not even think about what they had done to her, and she will not speak about it. And that is not uncommon, unfortunately. And so that's the kind of life. It's a life of, a life of excitement, sure, but it's also a life of extreme violence and like I said, the average age of death is 34 if you're doing dates. Um, so it is not a long life. Um, no, no cell phones. Uh, nobody has a phone. Um, nobody has a place to live. Nobody has a bank account. Nobody has a credit card. No, people have not ever had to sign a lease. We have to teach the girls how to sign a lease when we get them housing. 
Uh, we have to teach them how to do credit card, like how to do um, uh, checks and things like that. They've never done anything like that before. Um, and so in, uh, people talk about, oh, you should go get a job. Well, if you haven't been in school since you were 10, how are you supposed to get a job? That's just incredible. I remember even uh, looking at the statistics and, and uh, like every two weeks they're being displaced from where they were living for that period of time. They were, they were, they were being robbed on a regular basis. So they have nothing. And, and, and how, how many have some connection to home and some kind of support system? No support system, but connection to home. So I don't know if that makes sense to people, but the home again is so broken that they keep, they try to keep the connection to it. The home is not a place that's safe. It never, it never magically becomes that thing, but it is a place that they, is still home. So they still want to talk to people from home and it's still important to them. It's just never a place that is going to feel safe to them. So, or their family has, for a lot of the kids that are, um, that are, gay, lesbian, or transgender, they have been kicked out and they have no, they will, those families will not speak to them and they're out here by themselves. So it's just, it, it is the family, there is no support from family. Your family is the street. Um, your family becomes, it is, it is a community, backwards and forwards. And people misunderstand how much of a community it is. I can tell you right now that the day the first West Mesa victim went missing, who I think was Veronica, the day she went missing, somebody noticed she was missing. From the street i can tell you that every that probably for all the girls that was the case but they're not considered family so therefore then you know you don't work with the police so they didn't file police reports and stuff but they knew right away that someone that she was missing um and so it, yeah what's the ahead. profile of the men who are involved in purchasing sex trade workers interestingly there is no straight up profile of men 22 percent of all men will at some point in their lives purchase sex, but there's no straight pro, there's no profile of it necessarily. They come from all backgrounds, all age ranges, all nationalities, all everything. Um, it is, uh, we have kids out there who are 17, 18 who are purchasing sex. And then we have, uh, you know, older gentlemen in their eighties and nineties who are still, you know, doing stuff. So there is no, there is no one thing that, that, that is no, there's no wealth thing. There's no, I am, we have doctors and lawyers. We have guys who are in gangs. Who are? It's just it's everybody. It's it's across the board. Now these th these women, particularly that are involved in the sex trade work, um, the the statistics of assault are astounding. W what can you tell me about that? Um, so we the women probably get assaulted by customers. I would say they would, and it's a, about once a month. That's what our, our research is telling us. We're very much an evidence based group, so we do a lot of um, uh, and our and the women we help know that. Um, and so they're very used to us going up and asking them very odd questions all the time. But um, it's about once a month. So the either um, a rape, robbery, assault, or kidnapping um, in once a month. Um, and it's never any rhyme or reason to it. So it's kind of interesting if you, for those of us who aren't out on the street, if we think about it, you're walking around your normal life, you're going to the grocery store, you're doing whatever. At any point, you know you could get assaulted, attacked, all that kind of stuff. That just would be crazy for us, but that's the reality there. We will oftentimes, I try to explain to people that I, you know, we do outreach and it's not uncommon for us to have 30 women who are there. We're all laughing around and looking at clothes and stuff like that. And I try to explain to people that I will look at that group of 30 women and know for a fact, all of them will be raped violently in the next year to the point, And then several of them will be killed. And, and there's nothing to be done about that. I, I still have a hard time believing there's nothing that can be done to, to, to stop that, um, and so that's part of why we exist. Um, how, how many? So how many do you exist. think uh, you save a year? <laughs> I don't like the word save. I don't think we save anybody. I think we are there to help work with them if they want to, but we don't save anybody. Um, we give out some really nice underwear, um, but <laughs> other than that, um, for a year it's going to be um, it's eight hundred a month that we help. So um, whatever that is times 12, and I can't do that math in my head at the moment. So, um, but that's an average of how many. So when, when I say yeah. save, I, I guess I, I think of getting out and helping 
restore some normalcy to their life, uh, getting them free of drugs, uh, oh, that getting thing. them holding um, a job. Do you, are, are there any, any numbers or any metric to help you with that? Success for us, for a trafficking victim, is that we get chocolate. We say, for trafficking victims, we like some chocolate. I want them everyone says yes to chocolate. And then we go, hey, look at the bad guy list. It's a list of all the men. It's a list we put out every week of the men who are out attacking women on the street. And then we'll say, hey, look at this. You could get help right here with your trafficking. To us, that is a success that that, that day gave us that success for that, for that victim. A woman we've known longer than that who says, um, I'd like to have a better, you know, I'd like to have a sta more stable place to stay. We get her into housing and get her a, ho a housing voucher and get her into to someplace stable and actually get her into an apartment that she doesn't have to pay for for a couple of months until she gets stabilized. That's definitely a success. You know, the addiction piece, the addiction piece is the part that is, has to come almost after all of that because asking someone to get clean while they're on the street, while there's so much drugs around them and they're still going to get assaulted every single month is, is quite the ask. So we've had to change our, our successes, our, our, our saves are very, very small saves, but we hope over time that they add up to getting people to where they want to be. So. That's amazing. You are actually blessing many lives and probably more than you'll ever know. Folks, we, we've just spent some quality time with Christine Barber of Street Safe New Mexico. You can look up Street Safe New Mexico at Street Safe NM, that's New Mexico, NM.com. And uh, Christine, if there's uh, folks out here who want to donate to your cause or help in any way, let's say locally, what can they do to help? And then somebody that's living somewhere across the world, is there a way that they can donate and help? Um, the best way at the moment for people to help is going to be in uh, monetary donations. Since COVID started, um, most of the shelters have been shut down. And so getting a trafficking victim away from her trafficker um, getting a mom, we have mom today with five kids, all under the age of uh, six, um, getting them someplace safe is incredibly difficult. So we're spending almost all of our money in hotel rooms. Um, and so if they'd like to donate cash, they can go to paypal.me, M-E, forward slash street safe. And then they can donate there. And we would be grateful for any money. We are an all volunteer group. We are an all female group. Um, and we use everything goes towards helping the women. And the more women we can get into the, the hotels, into a stabilized, even for a week in a motel, it starts to show that there's options out there. And it starts to say, maybe I don't have to be in this tent, you know, forever. Maybe I can, maybe there's another life I could see. And that's all we really want is for them to see the potential in themselves. Our whole thing, mantra is the women are amazing as is whether they're addicted, selling sex, trafficking victims, any homeless, we don't care. They're amazing. And it helps us show them that they're amazing by being able to give them a door they can lock and stay safe at night for a couple of days is everything. So by, by way of intervention, is there something that a family member can do that sees a child or a loved one heading down this pathway or is there somewhere that they can, a, a person who is facing this choice of, uh, I've, I'm going to have to start uh, uh, becoming a uh, sex trade worker in order to support a drug habit or something else, but they haven't stepped off the edge yet. Where do they get help? There's no place specific for help for that, but you can call us. <laughs> Um, we have across our board of directors includes uh, women who uh, are uh, exotic dancers who support themselves through every, who have supported themselves, who do support themselves through legal and non-legal means. Um, we can go through the ins and outs of it with you and the, and the, all the, there are a lot of things to consider. And if it is a, it is a path that is definitely something that I think people should go on with their, with their their eyes open and have as much knowledge as they can. So you're welcome to call us. Our phone number is 505-999-1393. And we're happy to talk to you about it. Um, and happy to just say, you know, look, if you're considering this, let's have a conversation. We actually don't necessarily also 
we don't condemn sex work at all. It is a, as our girls will say, it is the most honest way to make money because they are selling something that only belongs to them and never belongs to anybody else. And it is, it is, it is, it is theirs to sell. We don't actually have a necessarily have a problem with that part of it. We have a problem with how they're victimized because of it. And so um, we will probably never talk anybody into it, but we won't talk anybody out of it necessarily. We'll just talk to you about it and give you the facts. And after hearing the facts, better way of handling it than talking yeah. about it. Uh, folks, we have been really privileged to hear from uh, an old and dear friend, Christine Barber of Street Safe New Mexico. Christine, you, you look great. I just am so thrilled to see you and look forward to the next opportunity we have to do some kind of documentary or something together yeah. and uh, wish you the very best. Thank you so much for taking Thank time you. today. You too. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Profiling Evil podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate us and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And please, don't forget to go to our YouTube channel where you can watch some of the hundreds of videos we've created. Now, if you're looking for a great crime story, check out my new book, Deceived, an investigative memoir of the Zion Society cult. You can find it at profilingevil.com. While you're there, you can also sign up for our elite newsletter, the Bolo. I'm Mike King and thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.